Okay, so um, I shall say good morning, everyone, right? Welcome to my uh, presentation, um, uh, where it's AI for ultra reliable and low latency communications in 6G. And actually, I have been working in the area of ultra reliable and low latency communications for nearly seven years. And since the past uh, three years, in the past three years, we started to uh, try to use some advanced machine learning technologies to uh, optimize communication systems to meet these uh, very stringent requirements in one of the three typical application scenarios of 5G. So um, this is the outline of my talk. I will first day briefly introduce the motivations of using wireless AI. And then I will present uh, some case studies in ULC system. And finally, I will summarize my talk and uh, discuss some future directions. Actually, all my uh, uh, content, all the contents that will be presented today can be found uh, in uh, this tutorial paper. So um, as you may know, um, actually ultra level and low communication is one of the uh, three new application scenarios in 5G, it requires uh, ultra low latency and ultra high reliability. So um, if we look forward to the area of 6G, we will see that there are a lot of new application scenarios with uh, <coughs> uh, high mobility or uh, long communication distance or uh, high data rate requirement like the uh, interactive VR and AR applications. We may also need uh, very uh, large connectivities in industry IoT or uh, global coverage for uh, wide area large scale networks for the um, uh, remote control systems. So uh, I would like to borrow the model of the uh, new model of Olympic uh, new Olympic model to uh, characterize. Uh, the features of the next generation you all see, it will be uh, faster, higher, stronger, and together. So what does this mean to uh, you all see in 6G? Um, faster means we will need to provide uh, faster responses to the end users by using some uh, mobile edge computing systems with edge servers, and the whole network needs to uh, make decision in a distributed manner. And in this way, we can avoid the long propagation delay from the end user to the central cloud. Well, high data rate uh, uh, required for some uh, application scenarios, like I just mentioned, the uh, VR, uh, highly interactive VR uh, uh, and AR applications with tactile devices. And to achieve this goal, we may need to use a uh, higher carrier frequency with extremely large scale antennas. And we also need to provide strong, stronger connectivity and coverage for the uh, whole wireless networks. We may have some potential technologies like multi-connectivity, uh, intelligent reflecting surface, and location-based meter wave and terahertz communications. Um, the reason why I just like to mention the reason why we need location-based communications is because uh, the uh, higher carrier frequency like millimeter wave and terahertz bands are, are very sensitive to the blockages. If there is a war between the transmitter and the receiver, the signal will be very weak. But if we know the location of the users, we may be able to adjust the uh, signals or change the uh, user association to uh, provide a better service to the end user. In that way, we can avoid service dis uh, interruption of the uh, ULC applications. And we also need to uh, uh, use uh, satellite communications or the uh, uh, 3GPP, call it the 5G uh, non-terrestrial networks to provide a wider coverage for the rural areas and and this is quite actually it is quite important for the countries like Australia because uh, in uh, large areas of Australia we do not have base stations there's no terrestrial networks so in this case satellite communications is uh, actually quite important for Australia 
And to achieve all those uh, targets, uh, we may need to use both uh, artificial intelligence and human intelligence, which are the domain knowledge we have obtained in the vertical industries, uh, like wireless communications, uh, factory automation, or autonomous vehicles to achieve uh, uh, this goal. So um, in this talk, I will mainly focus on the last part. How can we integrate artificial intelligence into domain knowledge, or how can we combine them together in communication system designs? That is what we call the uh, wireless AI. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, the motivation of using uh, domain knowledge in deep learning for uh, URC uh, communications. <clears throat> so um, as we know, with the state of the art 5G new radio, we can achieve one millisecond delay in the radio access network, but there is no end-to-end -end delay guarantee that like we only focus on the physical layer and the radio access networks. So to provide end-to-end -end, uh, latency guarantee, we may need a cross-layer model to design the system from uh, physical layer to link layer and to network layer. And we may, but we may also need to consider some features from the application layer. Well, the cross-layer design usually have a very high complexity. The problems are usually uh, non-convex. And if we use the existing or traditional optimization algorithms, it can hardly be implemented in a real-time manner uh, since we need to make decisions in around uh, every transmission time interval of our communication system, and that could be less than one millisecond in 5G new radio. So um, we will uh, introduce uh, a new technology called uh, Deep Neural Network to uh, approximate, to do some function approximation. And then we use a neural network to approximate a, uh, a policy obtained by a complicated optimization algorithm. In this way, we can do the real-time implementation. This is because the uh, forward propagation algorithm in neural network is really fast. And the problem is that we may need a, a complicated optimization algorithm and a long training phase for the deep neural networks. So to improve the learning efficiency, we propose to integrate the domain knowledge into deep learning algorithms. So in this way, the um, expert knowledge and the theoretical models we already obtained in the, like the fundamental trade-offs in wireless communications can be used to help us uh, guide the learning procedure. But the issue is that if we use this domain knowledge or the theoretical models, the uh, assumptions and the uh, simplified models may not be exactly the same as the real world system. So to achieve a good performance in a real system, we will need to fine tune those uh, pre-trained neural networks in the real world systems, like a prototype or a experiment and then in the real world uh, cellular networks. Okay, so here are some uh, case studies in uh, our recent work. So the first one, I will just introduce some basic ideas on using supervised deep learning for policy approximation. Then I will uh, 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 introduce some of our uh, theoretical studies on how to uh, uh, study the equivalence between the optimization algorithm and the deep learning algorithm. And then I will show a prototype that we use to validate our uh, most recent developed deep reinforcement learning algorithm for scheduler design in time-sensitive networks. Finally, uh, I will uh, summarize all those uh, case studies and highlight some major takeaways. So let's first come to the uh, supervised deep learning. And as we know, there are a lot of network functions in a communication system, like schedulers, resource allocation, mobility management entities, and there are some handover functions. 
or lateral slicing, as you can see here, we may use <coughs> some uh, numerical method to approximate those functions like use a linear approximation. And the idea is quite simple that we wanted to approxim approximate a mapping from a network status to a network decision. And with a linear approximation, we assume that the mapping is a linear function and we use some label training samples to train the weights and bias and try to minimize the errors between the output of the linear function and the labels. But as you know, the expressiveness of linear functions is limited. We can only uh, use linear functions to approximate uh, linear uh, network functions, but in uh, communication systems, with, uh, a lot of network functions are nonlinear. So we introduce some uh, nonlinearities into this function by using a nonlinear activation function outside of the uh, linear function. So the uh, activation function uh, could be, there are a lot of options and you can, I, I, I assure you, you can get a lot, a lot of options from the existing literature. And with that um, unit, we can build a phony connecting neural network that takes the uh, network state at the input and uh, output the uh, decision of a near optimal solution that is close to the label training samples. So this is uh, what we do with supervised deep learning. And the reason why we use this kind of uh, neural networks is because it is a universal approximator. What do you mean by a universal approximator? It means that for a continuous and deterministic function defined over a set uh, D, we can uh, get the following uh, result that uh, for any uh, epsilon that is positive, there exists a set of parameters that is a weight and the bias of the neural network such that we can guarantee the error is bounded by this small epsilon. And the required scale of the phonic connecting neural network increases with the, uh, uh, actually decreases with epsilon according to this expression. So this is what we have in uh, deep learning. So this feature gives us a chance to use uh, a neural network to approximate any continuous and deterministic function in our communication system. And the issue with supervised deep learning is that we may first need to find the optimal decisions for different realizations of network state. It means that we will need a uh, existing, maybe high complexity optimization algorithms to got the labeled training samples. And then we train this fully connected neural network by using the optimal solutions that is enable training samples. But if you do it in these two steps, with those two steps, actually the expert knowledge in various communication and the theoretical models in networks are not merged into the supervised learning algorithms. You first collect samples and then train the uh, neural network with the data-driven supervised deep learning. So I, I would like to emphasize that the knowledge here could be the algorithms, policies, and intuitions obtained by human experts in uh, any uh, vertical industries. And the uh, models here, uh, models, all the models in this presentation will be the mathematical formulations and descript uh, descriptions of communication systems. It is not the neural networks in deep learning or the transition probabilities of an MDP in the reinforcement learning. But in those two societies, they will also use the word uh, model to represent neural networks or the transition probabilities of an MDP. But in my talk, the models means the uh, formulations and descriptions of communication systems in our area. Okay. So given the issue of supervised deep learning, we, will, we uh, started to think about how can we combine the domain knowledge and those theoretical models in the training procedure of unsupervised deep learning. So <clears throat> in this part, I would like to first 
uh, introduce uh, the basic idea of unsupervised deep learning. So for the uh, traditional unsupervised deep learning, it does not tell us uh, which one decision is good or bad. It just tells us uh, they are different or they are similar. Like uh, I just have two types of channels. Where these channels here, the uh, horizontal X, if they transmit power, and the uh, vertical axis, if they receive SNR, both of them are normalized by the average value. As you can see, uh, the average value is set to be zero. They are normalized by the average value. So there are two types of uh, various channels that reflect the relationship between the transmit power and the receive SNR. So as you can see, if we use a, a unsupervised learning algorithm, we can do a uh, clustering, uh, we can do cluster by clustering those samples into two types of uh, two clusters. But with the domain knowledge in various communication, we know that there are some models can be used to characterize those two types of uh, wireless channels. For example, the blue samples, they may generate it by a region fading channel, while the orange samples are generated by a relay fading channels. So for region fitting channels, it means that there is a direct link between the transmitter and the receiver so that you can use a relative small transmit power to achieve a relative high receive SINR. Well, for relay fitting channel, there is no direct link between the transmitter and the receiver, but due to reflection, uh, scattering and diffraction, somehow the receiver can still receive got the uh, signal from the transmitter from different passes. So this, with this relay feeding channel, as you can see, the uh, variance of the received SNR is larger, while the required transmit power will be higher to achieve a target, uh, uh, like a target uh, data rate. So we do have those types of models in our uh, society, in, uh, in our, uh, existing literatures. Can we use them to help us to determine which decision should be made in a AI-enabled communication systems? So this is what we are doing in this work. So here is a very general method that with a very general optimization problem. So this problem actually is a functional optimization problem. It means that the optimization variable here, it is not a, a scalar or a vector with finite dimension. It is a function with infinite. You can, uh, a function could be a uh, infinite dimension vector, right? So this is actually a functional optimization problem. And the function actually could be any network functions that we are going to optimize, like the uh, mapping from a theta, like for example, theta is the realization of wireless channel, and x is the bandwidth allocation, the power allocation, or any uh, radio resource allocation in a wireless communication system. And we are trying to uh, minimize the cost of the system, like the energy consumption, like the required bandwidth, or uh, some other overheads of the system. Well, we need to maintain some constraints, like, for example, here could be a like the maximum transmit power constraint or maximum bandwidth constraint. Well, this long term statistic constraint could be a latency constraint or a queuing delay bound violation probability. So, with those two types of constraint, the instantaneous constraint and the statistic constraints, we can actually. Uh, use this uh, general problem to um, characterize a lot of uh, uh, optimization problems in our uh, communication systems. So for this problem, <clears throat> a traditional way to solve it is to uh, use the Lagrangian of it. Like this is, a, this is the objective function. This is the instantaneous constraint with a weight lambda i theta. And this is a, uh, a statistic constraint with a weight nu, nu j here. So this is actually a weighted sum of the objective function and the uh, constraints. And we can optimize 
both the uh, primal uh, variable x theta as well as the dual variable uh, lambda theta and mu to find the optimal solution. So the theoretical method is actually it's quite complicated. There's no need to understand uh, every detail here, but the idea is to solve the first order necessary conditions to find the uh, optimal solution. Like what we have, the KKT conditions in variable, uh, in variable optimization. And the only difference is that we need to replace the uh, vectors in variable optimization with a function here in function optimization. And the first order necessary condition here um, is actually a partial differential equation. We will uh, refer to it to as the Euler Lagrangian equation. Well, these three expressions are the uh, complementary snackness, and those two are the constraints uh, I have in this problem, we have in this problem. So, um, if you wanted to get the closed form solution of the original optimization problem, you will need to solve those partial differential equations, which is hard to get uh, a closed form result because sometimes those expressions are complicated and you cannot get those uh, results. And um, to address this issue, we found another approach to solve it numerically by using a neural network to approximate this uh, function x theta and use another neural network to approximate this dual variable lambda theta. So the idea is to use the primal dual method as we actually, we also have this primal dual method in the uh, variable optimization problems, but we use it in a function optimization problems by replacing uh, the uh, vectors with those two functions. And then we use two neural networks to approximate those two functions. Here we you uh, use a neural network with parameter uh, omega x to approximate uh, the function x theta and another neural network with uh, parameter omega lambda to approximate the dual variable. And then we can use primal dual algorithm to find the solution uh, of the uh, first order necessary condition by using uh, iter a iterative algorithm that is a stochastic gradient descent and stochastic gradient ascent to update the primal variable and the dual variable iteratively in the training stage. So <clears throat> here is a very simple example that we have, uh, uh, we have multiple users, different users will have different channels like the blue samples and the orange samples and we do not assume that we know the distribution of those samples. We just got those channel realizations that is the large scale channel gain, as well as a small scale channel gain, depending on the, uh, those uh, samples. And then based on those samples, we use the uh, fundamental results in information theory to quantify the achievable rate in the wireless link and we assume that the coding block length is finite. So we cannot achieve the Shannon capacity. There is another term here. Well, this term is actually a constraint on the queuing delay violation probability. And we also have a maximum bandwidth constraint. And <clears throat> the neural network here is actually a mapping from large scale channel gain to the uh, bandwidth allocation, but here it is a uh, vector optimization problems, but we can transfer it to a function optimization problems and serve, solve it with our unsupervised deep learning algorithm. So the uh, question is, does the unsupervised deep learning outperform supervised deep learning since uh, we use some uh, domain knowledge and the theoretical models? So let's say, let's compare the difference of those two types of training algorithm. So with supervised learning, we find label training samples with an optimization algorithm that is a, for example, a, a convex optimization algorithm to solve this problem. And then we train this FNN with label training samples. 
Well, with our supervised deep learning, we learn an FNN with an approximate uh, that directly approximate the optimization of the optimal policy with the primal dual method. And here is one example. If we compare the relative error of the objective function and the relative error of the constraint, we can see that with unsupervised deep learning, we can achieve those blue curves. Well, with supervised deep learning, we can achieve those red curves. And the results show that with unsupervised deep learning, the relative errors of both objective function and constraint is smaller than supervised learning algorithm. So why unsupervised learning can outperform supervised deep learning? The reason is that if we use, <coughs> if for example, if we are trying to minimize the approximation error of the ice constraint, so uh, the uh, error is the uh, average of the error is characterized by this expression, right? But if we use supervised learning, we are actually minimizing the output of the neural network and the labels. As you know, in wireless communications, those constraints are nonlinear. So like CI is a nonlinear function. And as a result, the loss function we use to train the supervised learning algorithm is not equivalent to the uh, mean square error of, the, of any of these constraints. Well in, supervised, well, in unsupervised deep learning, we have those constraints, we have the formulations of those constraints in our loss function. That is a Lagrangian of the constraint uh, function optimization problems. So we actually combine the communication models into the training stage. In this way, we can achieve a better performance by using unsupervised deep learning. So this is a major takeaway for the first part. The unsupervised deep learning does not need to know the distribution of samples and data. We do not need to assume that the model is relay or ration fading. And unsupervised deep learning outperforms supervised deep learning in terms of approximation accuracy with the help of domain knowledge and theoretical models. But we also need to know that this Unsupervised deep learning is only applicable when the objective function and constraints are differentiable. Otherwise, we cannot get the uh, first order necessary condition nor apply the primal dual method. Okay, the, I, I know the first work is quite uh, theoretical uh, and uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to understand those theoretical studies. But for the second topic, actually it's quite practical because this work is actually supported by a Australian uh, network operator. They uh, expected us to do some uh, demo to get a prototype for them to illustrate our idea. So let's go back to the unsupervised learning. What is the assumption in our unsupervised learning? That is the network states and decisions in different time slots are independent, which means that we only need to um, optimize the system in one time slot, then we can guarantee the optimality for the long-term performance of the network. Like if we can maximize the instantaneous achievable rate in every time slot, then of course we can maximize the average data rate in the communication system. But when will the, uh, when the states and the decisions are correlated in a queuing system or in a control system, then this approach will not work. This is because the decision in the current time slot will have impact on the state in the next time slot. So we cannot do the optimization in every time slot. So in this case, without, those, without this assumption, the unsupervised deep learning does not work. And as we know, deep reinforcement learning is a very useful tool that can be used to solve sequential decision-making problem. <clears throat> so let's come to our example problem. Um, we have a scheduler design problem that we need to determine which users to be scheduled and how many number of resource blocks shall be allocated to the scheduled users. 
by using the head of line delays of each buffer and the downlink SNRs of each user. So the network operator requires us to develop a programmable scheduler for time-sensitive networks that have stringent latency, jitter, and reliability requirement. So the jitter and reliability requirement can be described in this way, that we need to make sure that the packet are scheduled when their head of line delay, when their latency is between an interval that is higher than d minimum and, uh, and lower than d max. If the packet is not scheduled with this small interval, then it will be useless, like it will violate the jitter requirement. Well, even if the packet is scheduled at the right interval, at, in this interval, it may fail due to decoding error. So a packet is successfully received by the user only if it is scheduled in the small interval and it is decoded successfully. So actually this problem is actually a quite old topic that have been studied for nearly 20 years. But the reason why we need a new scheduler is because we have a new requirements, a new QoS quality of service requirement in our future communication system. And a very straightforward approach is to use an uh, existing deep reinforcement learning algorithm that takes the head of line delay and downlink SNR at the state and uh, the action or the decision is the users to be scheduled and the number of resource blocks to be allocated to those users. Well, we aim to maximize a, a certain kind of long-term reward, which is defined as a discounted reward of instantaneous reward. And the instantaneous reward is defined as an indicator. Two in, actually, depends on two indicators, whether the packet is scheduled in the small interval and whether the packet is successfully decoded by the receiver. So it seems like that with this straightforward approach, a existing algorithm, the problem is solved and we can get a good scheduler. But the fact is that if we try this existing deep reinforcement learning algorithm in this problem, then this scheduler design problem, we will have a lot of issues. The first one is related to the problem formulation. We have an extremely large action space and a uh, low and the state, the definition of the state with a very low flexibility. And we need a long training, a large number of, of samples to evaluate the reliability of the system. Well, in the training stage, the learning algorithm is not aware of the individual QS. It does not take account, take the uh, QS of each user into account. Mm -hmm. And the reward is delayed and sparse. And I will explain it later. And it is also the, the long-term reward function here is actually approximate by a neural network, which is not accurate enough for the rarely visited state action pairs. Well, in UILC, the packet loss probability is, is extremely small. It means that for those transitions with packet loss, they are rarely visited by the algorithm. But if the approximation is inaccurate in those state action pairs, how can we get a good policy that maximize those long-term reward. And for the online implementation, <clears throat> we also have, some, have two more issues. The first one is that we have very poor initial QS requirement if we directly train this uh, reinforcement learning algorithm in our prototype. And the second issue is that we will have a long processing time compared with the transmission time interval of 5G new radio that is less than one millisecond. So if we cannot finish the processing in one TTI, the output of the policy is outdated. So let's first come to the solutions uh, to the first types of issues that how can we uh, reformulate the problem by using some uh, result in the information theory that we use it, uh, uh, this expression 
to characterize the relationship between the resource allocation and the decoding error probability. So in this way, we can reduce the action space. And we also use this expression to normalize our state and use it to help the evaluation of reliability. So with this uh, result in information theory, our problem formulation can be greatly simplified. And to address the second type of issues, we first use a multi-head critic. So this is based on the expert knowledge on the structure of a neural network. That is the performance of the neural network depends on the performance of each individual. So the sum, the, the, the total reward of the system actually is the summation of the reward of each user. So we replace this single head reward with a multi-head reward. In this way, we can exploit the structure of the network to get a better uh, long-term reward estimation. Well, <clears throat> the second issue is the delayed reward or the sparse reward. So as I mentioned, if uh, in the definition of the reward here, actually in most of the time, the reward is zero if there's no packet scheduled or if the decoding is failed. Only when the packet is scheduled at the right time and is successful, it's successfully decoded, then we will receive a positive feedback. So the positive feedback is delayed and sparse. And to address this issue, we use the uh, expert knowledge on scheduler design to uh, modify the reward function. <clears throat> that is, we found that our goal is to keep the uh, head of line delay within D minimum and D max. So we add a potential function that, that looks like this. It means that if the stage of the system is here, then the instantaneous reward will be higher. If the state is here or here, then the instantaneous reward is smaller. So by changing the reward function, we can get a uh, non-zero feedback for every action. But the problem is that is this two, are those two objective functions equivalent? And the answer is yes. You can see a theoretical proof in this uh, paper that published around 20 years ago that the idea, the basic idea is that the potential function here only depends on the state of the system and does not depends on the, uh, depends on the action of the uh, system. So once we are optimizing the action, minimizing those two uh, objective function are equivalent. That is the uh, optimal policy will not uh, be changed by adding a term that does not depend on the action. So this term is actually a constant if we only consider the, uh, fun, uh, uh, the policy optimization. So this term will not change the optimality of the original problem. And the last thing is to use important sampling. So as I mentioned, in some rarely visited uh, state action pairs, the approximation error of the long-term reward is high. And actually, the packet loss probability is extremely small in URLC. So <clears throat> we, based on the knowledge on those two parts, we add a weight to each transition or each sample. So for example, if the estimation error is high and the number of packets uh, that are lost is not zero, then the weight of this uh, transition is higher than the other samples. And then we, when we are selecting a batch of samples to train our algorithm, the probability that a sample will be selected will be proportional to this weight. So in this way, we will select those uh, important transitions more frequently compared with the other well-trained uh, frequently, vis uh, frequently visited transitions. So in this way, we can improve the estimation accuracy of the long-term reward. And now let's come to um, 
the third part that they, they employ the initial QS and the loan processing time in each DTI. To improve the initial performance, a very simple way is to build a simulation platform of the prototype in our uh, computer and then do some uh, pre-training by interacting with this simulation platform to get an initial uh, neural network. And then with those initial neural networks, we uh, download those initial neural networks from a edge server to a actor in the base station in a uh, real world prototype, and then interact with the real world uh, communication environment to get transitions in real world networks. And then we save those transitions in our replay memory to further update those, or fine tune those two neural networks based on the transitions from the real world system. So in this way, we can get a initial performance, uh, a good initial performance, and we can also adjust the neural network according to the real world environment if it is dynamic. Well, to address the last issue that we need, we have a long processing time in each DTI. The idea is also quite simple that we use parallel processing to do the baseband signal processing, as well as the uh, forward propagation of the neural network to generate an action. So in this way, we can finish the, we can get the action within the, uh, by the end of each DTI. So here are some of our simulation results. If we uh, use this straightforward implementation of DDPG, as you can see, the algorithm learns lasting after a 90 minute of training phase. Well, if we use some use this theoretic formulation to simplify the pro, uh, the problem formulation, we can still uh, we can get a better performance, but the final convergence result the convergence result is not very good. Like the error probability is still relatively high. So once we incorporate the uh, expert knowledge into the training phase, as we can see, it converges faster and the final performance is much better. And we also show some more results on the convergence time. As you can see with the domain um, expert knowledge, the convergence, uh, we, we can get the purple curve. Well, if we do not have the uh, expert knowledge, we get the uh, blue curve, as you can see, with the expert knowledge, the reward uh, function increases much faster than the original direct implementation of DDPG. Well, we also uh, simulate the final reliability. As you can see, the blue bars are the final packet loss probability without important sampling. This figure shows the average packet loss probability. This figure shows the worst case, the packet loss probability of the worst case well, with important sampling, as you can see, these uh, red bars, it is much better than the blue bars, and it is also better than the other benchmarks like Ron Robin, early state and first, and maximum throughput. And we implement those algorithm, this algorithm in our prototype with a soft-defined radio system, and we generate some packets and evaluate the end-to-end uh, -end latency when it is received by the receiver. So we first train, we first have a random initialization uh, approach, as you can see with random initialization, it, most of the packets are transmitted before the D minimum. And we also have a very long tail after D max. So this is not a good performance. So we use some random initial, uh, we use some offline initialization then we can get the red dash curve. And then if we fine tune those two neural networks in the real world prototype, we can get a much better performance. But the thing is that there is a still a packet loss probability that is, that, that is much higher than 10 to minus five or 10 to minus seven. And this is because we only optimize the scheduler of the network that can only control the uh, communication delay in the radio access network and the queuing delay in the buffer of the base station. We cannot control the latency in the core network or the latency at the end user, at the user equipment for 
of decoding the packet, like the processing delay. And those two parts, we also introduce extra latency and delay and jitters to our system. And we also test the inference time. As we can see, we can get the result within one TTI. That, that is smaller than the uh, TTI in uh, 5G new radio. So the major takeaways are summarized here. Uh, the straightforward implementation of DDPG converges slowly and have poor QS performance and cannot be implemented in practice. Well, the models, theoretical formulas, and expert knowledge can help to reduce the convergence time and to improve the individual QS. And our online DDPG algorithm enables offline initialization and online fine tuning. And our scheduled policy can be updated according to the real world feedback every few minutes and can be executed in each TTI in 5G new radio. But the problem is that the hyperparameters of the phonic connecting neural networks are predetermined by trial and errors and are not flexible to the number of devices. So this is an issue that we will need to address in the future. And let's come to the uh, last part, the summary and future directions. So here is the uh, roadmap towards 6 URC, and the previous part have been discussed at the beginning of the presentation. This is what we have done. So what are the <coughs> uh, open issues for the 6 URC? The first one is that the quality of service requirements or the key performance indicator constraints are more diverse in 6G compared to with 5G ULC. So to address those, to guarantee those diverse QS requirements, we will need uh, like constraint deep reinforcement learning or safe reinforcement learning. And the issue I mentioned just now, the scalability issue of the neural network should can be addressed by using a graph neural network to represent the uh, wireless network. In this way, the training the number of training par training parameters in a graph neural network does not increase with the number of users or base stations in a wireless network. And the last issue is the uh, highly dynamic network status that may not be stationary. In this case, we need to apply some future learning or need to use some distributed learning based on the local data samples to fine tune those uh, neural networks. Those are the uh, three major research directions for the future uh, 6G URLC. And we also have mentioned some of those research, research directions uh, in this magazine paper that has been uh, accepted recently. Okay, so that this is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope I, 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 I'm, I'm not running out of time. <laughs> Any questions?